Thank you very much for our uh, in, uh, committee for inviting us for this talk. Today we will try to give you a short talk about what is a frontline treatment for cervical cancer in general and we will concentrate on the new classification which is done by the FIGO in 2018. Till now globally in spite of all the effort which is done, cervical cancer is still the most one of the most common cancer usually in for female usually it is the fourth worldwide and it is the second for <laughs> Uh, women's in gynecological cancer. The problem we are facing actually is that the majority of the new cases, and that is approximately 90% of both of them, are still occurring in the low residual cases for uh, people who are living in low economic country and in the low socioeconomic status. The basic reasons for that is that they do not have the access for healthcare services early in their disease. The situation here in our Saudi Arabia for women uh, cancer registry, we can see that cervical cancer is now still included in the first 10 common cancers affecting the Saudi woman, almost 1.6%. It is secondary to ovary and corpus uteri in gynecological cases. Worldwide, still the same. It is only localized most of the time in low socioeconomic countries, and that's the problem why we are discussing now the first step in the management, which it is the staging itself. We have so much debate between us regarding the staging. If we are going to do a complete staging for any woman, should we include cystoscopy, proctoscopy, perfect MRI, or beta scan or not? And to avoid the problem for staging the patient in the low socioeconomic countries, still now the staging is still clinical. It is not pathological, not surgical. It depends on a speculum and by manual vaginal examination for the patient and an IVP or abdominal ultrasound to make sure if the woman have any hydronephrosis or hydroureter. The other ones here, it's more sophisticated, but usually we advise if you have the resources, you can utilize it. If you do not have it, it's not mandatory part of the staging itself for the patient. The key points, patient diagnosed with either cervical cancer, they still have a very good chance for cure. And the important point here we have to remember is early in base of cancer. And this is a problem where we are facing actually here in our countries. Most of the patients who are referred to us are coming in either stage two or stage three or sometimes even stage four. Very rarely we see patients coming to us in stage one. The basic reasons for that, we don't have till now an established screening program in Saudi Arabia. And most of the time when the patient present for their either primary health physician or they present to their gynecologist, they are not having the proper workup or the proper diagnosis. They are sometimes even treated for abnormal bleeding or post coital bleeding without even doing a biopsy or a BAP smear. They're just giving medication, hormonal medication to control the bleeding. They think it is the reason. And nobody even examines the patient or do a BAP smear or do even a biopsy if they say abnormality inside the cervix itself. Treatment option, basically there is three treatments for the patients. Either it is surgery, radiation with concurrent chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone. And we'll go slightly in details regarding which one we are going to use it. The number one rules we have all to remember here is that we have to avoid giving both radical treatment, which is radical surgery, in association with the curative intent radiation treatment. Because for two reasons, the first one, the radiation itself after radical surgery will result in so much severe, more morbidity for the patient and complication. And the second one is that the only option for that patient in the future, if you have any recurrence after her radical surgery, is to receive radiation. But if she receives radiation from the beginning, she's losing all the chances to have any other modality of a treatment after her recurrence. But that's why we try to avoid combining both, and we'll see exactly later on how we are going to do that. The depending factor, the stage of the cancer is the most important, the general health of the woman and the availability of the facilities and the expertise in the center treating the woman and the primary surface according to those three factors usually will decide if the patient is going for surgery, concurrent chemo radiation or radiation alone or cancer. So on the staging, I'm sure all of you are aware about it. And the standard treatment or the standard education we had Till stage 2A surgery is the best option if the patient can tolerate a radical surgery. After that, chemo radiation is the best option. The reason for that, from all the studies has been done, it showed clearly that the response rate and the survival rate after both radical surgery and chemo radiation, it is the same. 
Or what you want to do is to reduce a combination of both, as we said, to avoid the risk of morbidity for the patient, high morbidity, and to give the patient an option of other option if she have a recurrence in the future. But that's why if you have two modalities which are equal in survival rate, equal in response rate, you should choose one of them, not both of them, to be given for the patient. When we speak about radical surgery, sometimes we have to clarify what we mean with it. Usually there is two classifications, the one by Beaver and Redledge from the state and the one by Corlew from France. It is the same type one, type A, we call it extra facial, which is a simple hysterectomy. Type two and type B, it is a modified radical hysterectomy. Type C and type C, it is actually what we call as extra radical or type C surgery. The only difference you can see it here from the uh, red points. This is the difference between the three types. And basically, it includes only the extent of the surgery are The changes now we have in FIBO 18, which is important, we'll concentrate on the, the important one, is this one. The changes they suggested is to change in 1B from 1B1, 1B2 only to include 1B1, 1B2, 1B3 according to the size of the tumor. The previous classification we have from 2009 classifies them as stage 1A, 1B1, 1B2, if it is less than 4, more than 4 centimeters. What they found, we see it now when they review the data for almost 70,000 women. In the old classification, there is a major difference in survival for the patient who are less than 2 centimeters between two to four centimeter and more than four centimeter in the size of the tumor. The reason for the survival was the volume of the tumor cells itself. If the patient have more than four centimeter mass in the cervix, they estimated that the volume of the tumor will be almost 500 cubic cc. That means the chances of lymph node metastasis will be very high for those patients. But that's why they classified them in 2018 in three instead of two. 1B1, it is less than 2 cm, and those are the ones who usually they do very well. 1B2, between 2 to 3.9 cm, anything more than or 4 cm is classified now as 1B3. The other difference in the staging is 3C. They included 3C, it was usually to be 3A, 3B. Now 3C, if there is built-in lymph node, and we put here R or B. R or B means radiologically or pathologically. Radiologically, for example, if you did a radiological test, CT scan for the biltis or the abdomen, and you found clearly there is a clear suspicious lymph nodes in the bilfic or in the bar aortic, or if you did a PET scan and it is shining and it's clarified that it is metastasis, we call it PLNR. Or if you did a biopsy for the patient, CT guided biopsy, and it came back as a metastatic disease, and you put it as B. What is the clinical utility? The clinical utility means how much we are getting benefit for the patient management and decision in the treatment for those patients after the new classification. We found out that for stage 1B cervical cancer, based on the tumor size, which is a new classification now, there is a significant difference between 1B1 and 1B2. Almost there is a double, two-fold increase in risk of mortality for the patient who are in stage 2B2. That means the tumor size between two to 3.9 centimeter. And there is almost four fold of increasing if it is more than four centimeter. The decision for a treatment for those patients is to avoid, for example, doing minimally invasive for staging 1B2 or 1B3, because these are the risk for having a lower even survival rate for those patients. Uh, the first step or the first utility here is to do what we call as risk certification. That means when you are comparing a study to a study, you should include the new classification rather than the old classification. And when you decide on the management for those patients, you should take them to the proper management. The second one is the impact of a tumor size on minimally invasive radical hysterectomy for early stage cervical cancer. The recommendation now, you should try to avoid doing the minimal invasive, it is 1B2 or higher than that. The third utility in 2018 classification for the patient, minimal invasive surgical approaches are associated with decreased survival if you are going to do it for stage 1B2 or 1B3. So for those cases, you usually would prefer to do the open approach rather than the minimally invasive, whether it is straightforward laparoscopy or robotic. And this was also proven with another uh, randomized study. The fourth utility we're going to discuss is the FIGO staging for 3C1, 
which has been found to be actually having a better response rate and a better survival rate when you compare them to staging 3A or 3B. 3A is involving the lower third of the vagina, 3B is involving the pelvic side. And the reason they found for that, that if the patient was a 3C1, that means only pelvic lymph nodes are affected, not the paraortic lymph node affecting, the chance of having a complete control regarding the pelvis and the good survival rate by using adjuvant radiation treatment after the surgery will give them a better outcome compared to stage 3A and 3B, even with the addition of adjuvant radiation treatment for 3A and 3B. That gives us an idea that only the pelvic lymph node involvement give a better prognosis for the patient compared to involvement of the pelvic side wall or the lower third of the vagina. They studied almost, as I said, more than 70,000 women over 25 years, and they found that the chances of having a patient with a new classification, 1B2, 40%, 1B1, 40%, 1B3, which is more than 40, was almost 19%. And the chances of having the pathological chances for adenocarcinoma histology, it was found to be more actually in 1B3, 1B1. In multivariate analysis for those patients, as I said, they found that there is a clear benefit of survival for the patient if they were found or diagnosed in the early stages 1B1 compared to 1B2, 1B3. And when we compare between also C1, C3, uh, C3, uh, 3C1 and 3A1 and 3B, uh, 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 the risk of survival and overall survival and disease-free was much better in the patient who are 3C1. That means they have only limited uh, pelvic lymph node involvement rather than involvement of the pelvic side wall or the lower third of the vagina. So stage three, huge when it's cervical cancer, according to the 2000 staging system, the direct there is a diverse range of survival outcome. If we compare the patient who have pelvic sidewall involvement or lower third of the vagina, in general, they do worse than if they have only pelvic lymph node involvement. I think the reason for that clearly is that to control the pelvic sidewall disease or the lower vagina with radiation, adjuvant radiation after surgery, is less, success, uh, less successful than controlling the pelvic side wall itself. So the surgical management, if we are going to advise the patient to go for a surgical management, surgery is suitable for the early stages, as I said, anything less than 2A, where cervical colonization, one option, total simple hysterectomy, another option, or radical hysterectomy may be selected. That will depend basically on the stage of the disease and the extent of the spread of the cancer. Ovarian transposition should be offered for women less than 40 to 45 years of age if they are going to have radiation treatment. So at least you can maintain the hormonal supplement for them instead of going to early menopause and other problems. For stage 1A1, usually the treatment is completed if for fertility preservation is acceptable for those patients. That means if you wanted to have a cervical colonization, which we call the white cone, Unless there is a lymphovascular space invasion during the bone, then cervical colonization may be an acceptable option if you want to preserve her fertility. And you have to make sure that the surgical margin are clear after the surgery, which is a cone itself. In women who completed childbearing or they're not concerned about their fertility, or older women than more than 45 years of age, total extirpation, the simple hysterectomy is a very good option for the patients who are at stage 1A1. Pelvic lymph node dissection, it is not recommended because the risk for usually involvement of the pelvic lymph node in those group of patients is very low. Any route can be chosen. You can do it either abdominally open laparotomy, or you can do vagina, or you can do laparoscopic or robotic according to the facility you have and your experience. But all of them is considered a safe surgical option for those patients. So you can choose whatever appropriate to you and to the patient itself. The next one, which is stage 1A2, there is a small risk of lymph nodes usually in those patients, usually range between 5 to 7 percent. And that's why in these cases, you usually, most of the surgeons prefer to go for the modified radical hysterectomy plus lymph node dissection. In lower risk cases, simple hysterectomy or even triclectomy can be done for those patients according to the experience you have. And pelvic lymph node nomination can be done either by sentinel lymph node or by sambilic itself. Both of them are adequate. When the patient desires fertility, she might offer to choose one of the following, either cervical colonization with laparoscopic pelvic lymph and anectomy. It should be done before the colonization and then usually for frozen section. If it is positive, then there is no point to do a cervical colon in this case because she will need to have radiation to the pelvis and the uterus will not be able to have any pregnancy after radiation. 
or you can go for radical abdominal vaginal laparoscopic tracheotomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy in the same setting and the same we send it for a frozen section before we do the main procedure for him. If we did for the patient usually this option which is a, a fertility preservation the follow-up is very important that every three months you should have a pap screen for the first two years and then every six months for the next three years. So we're not going to lose any chance of recurrence or residual disease with those patients. With normal follow-up after five years, the patient can be returned to a routine screening that means according to her age once a year. For higher stage, which is usually the stage 1B1, 1B2, and 2A1 usually, we still advise that you should go to the radical hysterectomy, which is type C or type 3, according to that one, with complete or proper lymph node dissection for those patients. The advantage we prefer to do the surgical treatment on the radiation treatment is that it usually facilitates the post-operative precise pathological finding and precise histological diagnosis of the risk factor for the patient so you can give her a better prognosis understanding for her. And usually cancer cells can be less resistant to radiation treatment if she needs to have radiotherapy after that as adjuvant part and the preservation of the ovarian, as we said before, and sexual function for the patient. So she will not have the brachytherapy, she will not have the vaginal stenosis, so she will have better sexual function, and the presence or the transposition of the ovaries, etc. For stage 1B1, usually is considered to be low risk if she has the following criteria in her condition. The largest tumor is at 2 cm, no <coughs> suspicious lymph node on imaging with a CT scan, and the third measurement is the same. We do type C radical hysterectomy, but still, modified radical, it can be an acceptable question, and basically, if not, the section should be always included, either by sentinel or by sampling of the patient. It's very important to remember, if you're going to do type C or the type uh, 3 radical hysterectomy, you should do your best to avoid injuring the pelvic uh, lymphatics and also the pelvic actual neural connection for them. We do nerve sparing surgical procedures, trying to avoid the hypogastric nerve, which is a very important one, the sprang nerve, and the pelvic plexus, which is very important to maintain the function of the rectum itself. Once we try to cut the uterus sacral, we try to avoid injuring the pelvic plexus as much as we can. So she will have a normal defecation rather than having a mega colon after the surgery. <coughs> Radical tracheotomy, it is an acceptable option for a young woman who desires to have fertility, as we said before, even for the stage 1B1, 1B2, or 2A1. And usually it needs a good experience to be done with the proper staging, either you can do it vaginal or abdominally. And can be done, as I said, vaginally, abdominally, or minimally invasive if you have the experience to use that. But when vaginal is approached as a plan, the pelvic nodes are first removed the same laparoscopically, and then we send them all for a frozen section. If they came positive, then there is no point to do a tracheotomy alone. You should go immediately to type 3 uh, radical hysterectomy. Intraoperative actual transposition of the ovaries can be done during the same time. Sentinel lymph node, we discussed it this morning in endometrial, it has much more established actually root in endometrium rather than in the cervix. The cervix, the problem with it, the distant metastasis usually is faster. And the other one is the metastasis to the other type of lymph node rather than the pelvic itself. It goes actually to the obturator group. And sometimes it's very difficult to see it there. For invasive cervical cancer, as we said before, uh, we have to remember that there was a very good study regarding laparoscopic approach to cervical cancer where they found that doing laparoscopic, whether it is conventional laparoscopy or robotic surgery for those patients carries a higher risk of recurrence for those patients compared to laparotomy itself. They concluded that hysterectomy by a minimally invasive route was associated with a higher rate of recurrence than open approach even in early stage cervical cancer. But we have to remember this was done based on the old classifications, old FIGO classifications, the 2009, which have 1B1, 1B2. They did not have 1B1, 1B2, 1B3. Because now the recommendation you can do the minimally invasive for the patient who are in 1B1 only, that means 2 cm or less. Higher than that, you should go for the open to avoid the higher risk of recurrence. 1B3 and 2A, as I said before, the same treatment for them. It is usually the type C or uh, C uh, uh, radical hysterectomy. Now, so with FIGO staging 1B3 and 1B2A are the same, the dual method, method, which is usually including the risk of morbidity for the patient. That means if we try to combine doing radical surgery and then follow it up by radiation, the patient will end with very high incidence of morbidity for those patients. New approach now they are doing it, what we call as a new adjuvant chemotherapy for the patient. Usually there is not much experience in a new adjuvant chemotherapy. 
Basically, it is usually utilized in area or countries where they do not have the facility to do radiation or sometimes in center, for example, in some countries, they don't have center for radiation treatment. And you have a patient coming with, for example, stage uh, 2B, and she has parametric involvement. So she cannot have radiation treatment. And if you did the surgery, you know from the beginning, it will not be the proper surgery because you will cut through the tumor and you will have a high risk of recurrence. The other option is to give her a new adjuvant chemotherapy and then assist the patient. If she responded well, you can do the surgery for her. But as I said, this is only limited to area or situation where you do not have the proper radiation oncology department or facility to give the treatment, which is the standard treatment for most patients. Can we use radiation treatment as an option instead of the surgery for the patient? The answer is yes, you can utilize it. If the patient, for medical reasons, she's not suitable for surgery, if the anesthesia puts her at a very high risk for anesthesia, and in these cases, radiation treatment by itself can be a better option, and it gives the same rate of survival and disease-free interval for most patients. For the early staging, the two treatment arms usually resulted in similar overall survival between surgery and radiation. It was actually better for radiation. And severe morbidity was higher if the surgery and the radiation was combined together. And this is what we said from the beginning. We should try our best to avoid combining both of them. So the best option actually for treating for cervical cancer, as I said, you have to do the proper staging. You have to assist the patient herself, her general condition, her will stand for major surgery or not. And actually, then you have to see the facilities you have. It was documented by many studies that the most important, actually, uh, non-dependent uh, prognostic factor for the patient, that means not dependent on the patient herself or the tumor itself, is the center she is treated in. If the patient is treated in a good tertiary care center, the chances that she will have the proper management is much higher. And the most important factor in the, not dependent on the tumor or the patient itself is the center she is treating of. And the other problem, as I said, in our community here, we should do our very best actually to encourage the woman for early detection, early diagnosis, and screening rather than starting to treat them after they are diagnosed with advanced stage of cervical cancer. Thank you very much.